Good morning, everybody. It is Saturday here in uh, downtown Nicosia. It's nine o'clock and I'm actually at an intersection of probably the most popular street in, uh, in Nicosia. Definitely the busiest, one of the busiest streets in Nicosia. And I'm sitting on a bench here and I'm turning the camera outwards so you can kind of see the, uh, the traffic, the buses go by, the car wash across the street. Over there is, uh, is a small little church where they're finishing up the liturgy. So you may be hearing some of the, the singing and the liturgy in the background. But uh, let's do a video. Let's get caught up on the news. There's a, quite a lot to talk about on the, on the economic front, the gas for rubles front, actually, and, uh, and the Germany front, because Schultz gave, a, gave an interesting interview with, uh, with Spiegel in Germany yesterday, and he talked about a lot of things. But before we get into that, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about what's going on on the ground and about a story that I've been following pretty closely, I think. And it has to do with... Uh, with the operation in the south of Ukraine. And we'll talk a little bit about Kharkiv as well, but I've been reporting for the better part of two weeks how the Russians have, have made a lot of progress in the south of Ukraine and um, specifically with regards to Kherson, the region of Kherson, and uh, creating the land bridge to Crimea and how this region of Kherson was uh, considering a referendum to become uh, independent of Ukraine, whether that was going to be its own separate republic that, like Donetsk and Lugansk, or whether it was going to to vote to become of the Russian, to become part of the Russian Federation like Crimea. I mean, no, no one really knows, but there were definite signs that the region of Kherson was uh, moving towards autonomy. And we're getting more signs now uh, of that happening. And outside of the fact that they switched to the ruble, that, that really tipped me off. When they switched to the ruble, I was like, okay, this, this region is not going back. This province is not going back. And uh, then we have reports of the Russian media operating there. And I've shown photos of the Russian flag going on top of all uh, administrative buildings. And so now we're getting more and more news that the regions of Kherson, Zaporozhye, as well as up top, Kharkiv, the, the region of Kharkiv, where you still have the city of Kharkiv, which is not under Russian control, but with each passing day, it seems like the region around Kharkiv is, uh, is falling more and more under uh, Russian control. These regions, it looks like, may be uh, moving sometime in the near future, in the short term, towards declaring some sort of autonomy. And I'm gonna take you to the Saker block and I'm also going to put up a map, and I'm going to take you to the Saker blog, which is reporting on this. And this is what the Saker blog said, and I'm just going to read it out to you as it's being reported from that blog. I'll put a link to this, uh, to the Saker down below. And it says this, it says, a Ukrainian politician has stated the following, Ludmila Denisova, a Ukrainian parliament commissioner for human rights, says that the Russians are planning to hold an independence referendum in Kherson during May 1st to May 10th to create another DNR and LNR-like statelet in southern Ukraine. Ballots are reportedly being printed. That's a quote also from the Saker blog. It says, Crimean Tartars report to the inclusion of Kherson and Zaporozhye regions in the Crimean Federal District. The Crimean Tartars propose to create the Crimean Federal District with the inclusion of the south of Ukraine the statement was made by the head of the Regional National Cultural Autonomy of the Crimean Tartars, Evaz Umerov. Residents of Kherson and Azov parts of the Zaporozhye regions of Ukraine who once belonged to the Ta Tariyed province together with Crimea speak of their desire to return to Russia because they no longer want to be under the yoke of Ukrainian nationalists. At least two-thirds of the residents of southern Ukraine, in particular Kherson Oblast, parts of Nikolaev Oblast, and Zaporozhye, would vote in favor of joining Russia in a, if an appropriate referendum were to be held, says Crimean Senator of the Russian Federation Council, Sergei 
Tsekov. Today, Ukraine threatened that if Russia holds a referendum for the Kherson People's Republic, then Ukraine will withdraw from all negotiations with Russia. Likely, Russia isn't worried. And now there's word that Kharkiv, too, may eventually be allowed to hold a referendum, giving us a clue as to Russia's ultimate vision for the, Khar for the Kharkov Oblast. Following the stabilization of the situation in the, liberate, in the liberated territories of the Kharkov region, a referendum or a poll of citizens can be held on the political future of the region, head of the Interim Political Administration of Liberated Kharkov region, told Ria Novosti. Rustam Minekaev, deputy commander of the Central Military District of Russia, has stated that the goal of phase two is to capture Donbass and create a land corridor to Crimea. Peskov reaffirmed the goal to integrate most of the southern areas of Ukraine into the Russian space. Minakayev also said that controlling southern Ukraine would open another way to Transnistria, where he claimed there are also instances of oppressing the Russian-speaking population. I'll leave it there. The full article, actually the full sit rep, and a fantastic sit rep um, on the Saker blog. You can read this part that I just relayed out to everybody. But I wanted to get it all in there because I think there's some interesting quotes and interesting insights given from various officials in the region. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen by any means, nor is the Saker, nor is this reporting. It's just merely giving you the quotes from what various military officials, Ukrainian officials, as well as officials in the region of, of Kherson, Crimea, and Kharkov are saying. Uh, this territory, in my opinion, is not going back. And I'm going to put a map up, up, up on the screen right now. And uh, I think this is what the likely outcome of phase two, phase three is going to look like. Whatever phase two means and whatever phase three may eventually mean, I think this may be what the map will look like when uh, those phases come to a conclusion. In my personal opinion, I think this is what uh, the future of what was known as Ukraine may actually look like when uh, the military operation wraps up. And I say that because I still don't believe, and I could be completely wrong, but I just don't believe that uh, the Kremlin is interested in, in the West. And I don't even think they're that interested in Kiev. Yes, Kiev holds historical significance, but it's nothing compared to the significance that Odessa holds. And when it comes to the strategic importance, the natural resources, controlling the port, controlling the sea, it, I mean, it's... It's a no-brainer that the Russians are going to expand further from Kherson all the way to Odessa and eventually creating that bridge to Transnistria. Remember, Transnistria is this, uh, this enclave, this exclave of, uh, in Moldova of, of Russian-speaking uh, citizens, and, and, and there is a military presence there. If I'm, not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, there is a military presence there. And so uh, this would provide that land bridge to Transnistria as well. And uh, as far as going to Kiev, Kiev's a possibility. I just don't see it. But as far as trying to, uh, to go to Kiev and go further west, I just don't see the, the reason to do so because you're dealing with a population that isn't... Uh, isn't warm to, to the Russian Federation. And they don't consider themselves, many of them, they don't consider themselves uh, of the Russian world, of the Ruskimir. And, and then you get into Lviv and, and the areas way out west, which, which have a strong Bandera uh, affiliation. And I just think the, the Russians are gonna say, you know what, EU, take this rump Ukraine, which has no access to the sea, no access to the, uh, to the important agricultural land, no access to the energy resources, take it and uh, start paying your seven billion a month to it. And if we see any militarization take place, I think the Russians will just use uh, missiles. I, I really think that may be the plan. But once again, I'm, this is just my, I'm just thinking out loud here uh, after reading this information and after looking at this map, let me know in the comments what you think. Let me know in the comments what you think and how you see things. So let's move to uh, Schultz and let's move to uh, Joseph Burrell, the, uh, the intellectually challenged foreign minister of the, uh, of the European Union. 
So let's start first with, uh, let's talk about Burrell. And I've got a clown world, a short clown world, but a good clown world. So Burrell came out with some statements. And the first statement that he made was, uh, and he gave an interview to, I believe, to the uh, Lena News Alliance, and it was picked up by Le Figaro. And Burrell said that uh, the EU is fully committed to supplying more and more arms and weapons to Ukraine. He said, quote, our military aid to Ukraine will continue and will be increased. The European top diplomat said, our goal is to prevent Moscow from establishing its control over the country, occupying the capital, Kiev, and changing the government and establishing its superiority. We want to help the Ukrainians defend themselves. Very important because Borrell's last comments that he made about military aid to Ukraine, he was talking about providing weapons to Ukraine in order to help the Ukrainians defeat the Russians. And he said the only solution was a military solution. And he's made many statements where he said, that uh, the European Union would accept nothing, nothing except a full and whole Ukraine. In other words, they wouldn't accept more occupied uh, territory from the Russians. And now it looks like, reading his statements, he's saying now, the goal of the EU is to stop the Russians from taking the capital, Kiev, and from um and the eu's goal is to help the ukrainians defend themselves not to help the ukrainians win the war but to help the ukrainians defend themselves so i, I maybe i'm reading too much into it but i'm thinking that Burrell sees what's up he knows what's uh what's coming if he hasn't known for a while now then i'm sure he knows now the truth of the matter as to what's happening on the ground and he's starting to uh to weasel word his way out of his uh his previous statements uh, Burrell also said that there's no uh, there's no unanimous decision with regard to energy, energy sanctions now in the EU. And that's also a walk back. Remember, Burrell was coming out with statements last week, all the EU. They were saying that uh, we're, we're uh, completely uh, unanimous in our decision to ban Russian energy, and we're going to ban coal, and we're going to ban gas. We're going to ban oil. We're going to put an oil embargo next week. Once we get little Napoleon Macron into uh, into office in France, we're going to ban oil. And uh, the EU is is united in solidarity to uh, stick it to Putin with regards to energy. Well, now Borrell is saying that there is no unanimous decision with regards to uh, energy sanctions and energy embargo. Quote, in the near future, we will return to the sanctions issue, but some countries have already said they would veto collective decisions. Hmm. That is what Burrell said. It will be very hard to reach consent on embargoing Russian oil deliveries or raising tariffs because some member states have already announced they would veto any collective decision. This is coming from Le Figaro, quoting Burrell. So that's Burrell. He is walking back his words. This is important because we have news coming from the European Commission where they are now saying that, you know what? You know that gas for ruble scheme and how we were complaining and whining about it, how it uh, goes against our sanctions? Well, after further examination, the gas for ruble scheme doesn't really go against the sanctions we've placed on Russia. And it looks like we'll be able to pay for the gas with, uh, with this uh, Kremlin policy of gas for rubles, i.e. depositing uh, foreign currencies in Gazprom Bank, having Russia do the uh, foreign exchange transaction into rubles, and then Russia, Gazprom Bank, then deposits those rubles once again in an account specified by Gazprom Bank, where then the gas will be released. Everything is under the control of the Russians, everything is under the, uh, the whole process is going through the Russian state and through Gazprom Bank. And uh, the EU threw a fit three weeks ago, two weeks ago. We'll never do it, they said. No way, we will never uh, support Putin's war machine. Remember those statements? We'll never support Putin's war machine. Well, now it looks like the European Union is eating their words. And let me read you some commentary here. It is saying that uh, the European Union companies may be able to comply with Russia's proposed system to pay for gas in rubles without 
falling foul of the bloc's sanctions against Moscow, the European Com Commission said on Friday. At the same time, EU executives say that it is not yet clear how such a scheme would work. They know how it's going to work. They know exactly how it's going to work. They're just trying to, to ease the public into it. They're drip feeding the news to the European public because if they just came out right and said, well, we're now going to pay for the gas uh, in accordance with the gas for rubles scheme, then everyone would say, you know, you guys are a bunch of, of, uh, of you know what, <laughs> I'm not going to say the word, but uh, they're just trying to drip feed the public and say, we're not sure how this is going to work and we don't know how we're going to do it, but maybe there's a way we can do it without uh, going against our sanctions policy. They know exactly how it's going to work. They have all the papers, all the documentation has been given to them from uh, Gazprom Bank. It's been given to all the companies and all the uh, interested parties. They know exactly how all of this is going down. They're just trying to gaslight and lie and drip feed the public into what eventually will be the European Union throwing in the towel and saying, you know what, we need Russian gas and we're going to do whatever the Kremlin tells us to do. Last week, the EC said that paying for Russian gas in rubles by European Union buyers, as demanded by Moscow, would break the EU sanction regime, quote, the mechanism would lead to a breach of the existing EU restrictive measures adopted in respect of Russia, its government, the Central Bank of Russia, and the proxies, an eternal note seen by Reuters read. Well, now it's saying the settlement switch may be possible without breaching sanctions, the European Commission has stated. And that leads me into the, uh, the interview from Schultz. So Schultz gave an interview saying pretty much the same thing. So Schultz told Der Spiegel, quote, Firstly, I don't see at all that a gas embargo would end the war. He added that if Russian President Vladimir Putin were open to economic arguments, he would never have started the insane war. He also said that critics of Germany's position on Russian gas act as if we're all about making money. But the point is that we want to avoid a dramatic economic crisis, the loss of millions of jobs and factories, that would never open again, that would have serious consequences for our country, for the whole of Europe, and it would severely affect the financing of Ukraine's reconstruction. Reconstruction. Schultz also said that Germany can't let that happen. Schultz also pointed out that such an embargo would have global consequences. And this is an echo of the statements from US Tre Tre Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who also said on Thursday that a complete EU ban on Russian oil and gas imports would completely cause more harm than good. Yellen said it would actually have very little negative impact on Russia because although Russia might export less, the price it gets for its exports would go up, is what Yellen said. So that is Schultz saying that there's going to be no gas embargo. He also said to Der Spiegel that uh, we need a, a cool head and well-considered decisions because our country bears responsibility for peace and security throughout Europe. I don't think it's justified for Germany and NATO to become warring parties in Ukraine. He was talking about weapons shipments to Ukraine as well. And uh, he's just basic. He basically walked back everything that he's been talking about. What else did he say? He said introducing a no-fly zone, as was demanded, would have turned NATO into a party to this war. He said, uh, I said, I very... I said very early on that we must do everything possible to avoid a direct military confrontation between NATO and a highly armed superpower like Russia, a nuclear power. I am doing everything to prevent an escalation leading to a third world war. There must be no nuclear war. He also said there has to be a ceasefire. The Russian troops have to withdraw. There must be a peace agreement that will allow Ukraine to defend itself in the future. We will equip them in such a way that their safety is guaranteed and we are available as a guarantor power. There will be no dictated peace of the kind that Putin had long dreamed of. There he is wrong. There he is wrong. Putin is calling all the shots. He will walk this back as well in four to six weeks. You'll see. Germany will walk back those statements. Schultz will walk back his statements if, if Schultz is even in power in four to six weeks. So basically, I've given you a bunch of quotes that uh, Schultz uh, gave to his interview to Der Spiegel. He's basically uh, talking about walking back the oil embargoes, not putting embargoes on gas. He's talking about NATO's involvement in the conflict. NATO is already involved, but he's trying to water that down as well. And, uh, and he's basically also seeing the writing on the wall.
Let me know what you think of his comments. That's Schultz. Those are the comments from Burrell. Those are the comments from the EU. Uh, from the Russian side of things, the head of uh, VTB Bank, um, a Mr. Andrei Kostin, said in an interview with Russia 24 TV channel that a real default is out of the question with regard to Russia. Russia's financial position always was and still is very stable. Reserves of the Bank of Russia exceed the entire state external debt. There would be no problem with settlements if there was at least some rational policy for our Western partners, he said. And that is the statement coming out of the head of the VT Bank, a very important uh, financial institution in Russia. And it echoes the statements made by the central bank head, Elvira Nabulina, saying that a default is out of the question. And the comment from the VTB head is interesting because he said a real default. And that's the, that's the trick to what's going on. The West may say it's a default because they're not accepting Russia to pay for, uh, for whatever debt they have, which is a very small debt, very little debt, which is an incredible uh, accompli accomplishment in and of itself. It shows that the Russian government is uh, very fiscally responsible, very conservative with its spending. How about that? A G20 country that's very conservative with its spending. That's, that's, that, that's, that would be nice to see in, uh, in the collective West, wouldn't it? But um, what uh, the collective West may do and what they are saying is that we're not going to accept rubles. And obviously there's a complete sanctions there's a complete blanket sanction with regards to uh, foreign reserves. So, you know, how is Russia going to pay for that debt? And what the collective West is going to say, well, if you can't pay for, for your debts with, uh, with euros and USD, well, then you're in default. And then they're going to get Moody's and Standard and Poor's and all of these uh, compromised shill financial credit ratings, agencies, whatever, <laughs> whatever you would call them. Uh, they're going to come out and issue statements that Russia is in default and, and all of these things. And, you know, they'll start their media PR campaign to say that Russia is in default. But, you know, the VTB head is right. Russia is not in real default because if the collective West would accept this debt in rubles, which Russia is awash in, well, then they'd be, they'd be able to pay it easily. No problem. But, uh, you know, the collective West is not going to do that because... It's all about getting media PR optic points. Ursula van der Leyen, Joe Biden, they want to get on the stage. They want to get in front of that podium and say, and Jen Psaki, and say, you know what? Russia defaulted. They're bankrupt. They defaulted on their debts, so i.e. they're bankrupt. That's what they want. That's what they're aiming for, is that little soundbite, which will then gaslight the, uh, the citizens of the collective West to say, oh, Sleepy Joe and... And uh, Ursula van der Leyen, you see, they finally brought the Russian economy to its knees. It's in default. It's bankrupt. That's not the case. If they would accept rubles, Russia would pay for it. Hell, if they would open up Russia's uh, ability to pay in foreign uh, currencies, Russia could easily pay its debt. No problem. Let's not forget that the collective West has stolen $300 billion of Russia's, uh, of Russia's money. Theft. They stole it. And Jake Sullivan said, we're not going to give it back. We're going to divvy it up. He didn't say we're going to divvy it up, but that's what he was hinting at. We're going to, we're going to divvy it up. Yeah, we got $300 billion. Party time. Party time for, for Jake Sullivan, Hillary, and, and all that clan. So, yeah, that's what's going on there. Let's see. Do I have time for a clown world? Oh, by the way, Victoria Newland gave, uh, gave an interview the other day. Uh, the Wicked Witch of... Uh, of the West, <laughs> Victoria Newland, I think Gonzalo called her that, I'm not sure, but um, she said, and maybe I'll get into some more detail with this, with regard to Newland and, and Payet, I have, a, I have some news to get to get to with regard to this, but Victoria Newland said that if Russia uses uh, a tactical nuke, then they're, then they're going to pay a devastating price, pure projection. When Victoria Newland says that if Russia uses a tactical nuke in Ukraine, that means that the that Victoria Newland and the Department of State is making plans to use some sort of tactical nuke. <laughs> that's, what, that's how I read it. Pure projection, mirroring, as, the, uh, as Alexander noted in uh, a live stream we did a couple of days ago, and this is what the Russian government says they're doing. They're mirroring. Whatever they're saying Russia is up to is actually what they're planning to do. So the Department of State is run by crazies like Newland, like Blinken, um, 
you know, they're, they're definitely thinking that uh, maybe they'll be able to pull off some sort of tactical nuke, I don't know, false flag or something. Who the hell knows what's going on in there? in their crazy, crazy heads. But uh, there's no doubt about it that, that their mind now is on some sort of uh, tactical nuke solution to prevent Russia from achieving its inevitable uh, military victory in Ukraine and what it looks like to be an economic victory as well because everything I've just reported to you is, is evidence of the fact that in this economic war of attrition, the, uh, the collective West is losing bad real bad. So anyway, that's the video guys. A real quick, quick, uh, I can't speak a real quick clown world. <laughs> and, uh, this clown world, I don't know if this is real or not. Like, I don't know if this is really the Russian military. It looks like it, but check out this photo. And it looks like a convoy of military trucks, I don't know, supply trucks. I don't, I don't know what they are, but, uh, because I couldn't find an article, uh, explaining what's going on here. So if, the, if someone finds an article, as to what's going on here and if this is really the Russian military, please uh, share it with everybody. But um, here you can see what looks like to be the Russian military and instead of uh, the Z's and the V's, they've actually put the entire alphabet on those trucks. And, and when you look closely, it's not only the front truck, it's the trucks in the back as well. So it looks like all the trucks have the, uh, the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. And if this is real, like if this is the real deal and this is really the Russian military and this really has to do with, I don't know, getting supplies to, to the front lines or, or anything along those lines, then this is the greatest troll in the history of the world. I mean, this is, this is some troll from the Russian military. I can't confirm that uh, this really is the Russian military. It looks like it. And I can't confirm that these are supplies being driven to the front lines. I don't know. But if it is, wow, wow, is that some troll? Anyway, that's the video, guys. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Durant's channel. And I am signing out, and now I am going to go and grab a coffee and get this video up. Take care.